welcome again to uh, another uh, opportunity to worship our Lord together. Um, just a couple of um, announcements. Uh, first off, uh, we heard this morning that Rosemary Price is in hospital. Um, we assume that's Christchurch uh, with, with back problems. Um, so we'll try and find some more details, but if if anyone is able to, to visit, then that would be appreciated. A special thank you to Yantina and Leilani for a very enjoyable afternoon. Uh, thanks for all the work and the inspiration to that as well. Normally, church visitations are advertised a couple of weeks in the bulletin. Um, we have church visitation on the 10th of September. The date has been moving around quite a bit, so uh, we don't have the normal notice. Um, but if there are any uh, questions you want to raise with the church visitors, uh, we'll, we'll be meeting on the 10th of September with them. And we will start our uh, worship service tonight singing Psalm 119 verses 57 to 64. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Forget. Also, after the service, if you could remain seated, we will have an election, um, part two, and we, we've we've come up with a new idea. We'll use voting forms. <laughs> so, thank you. Once again, good afternoon, and uh, it's great to be able to gather together for worship. In Psalm 95, we have these wonderful words, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let's come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. Will you join me now as I, in a moment of personal individual prayer, just take a moment to seek the Lord, to call upon him in your heart that he indeed may bless you to make you a blessing as we worship in the name of the Lord. Let us pray. O oh God and Father, hear our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand? 
We stand to acknowledge that we are the body of Christ, the church at worship, and that as a church we acknowledge and believe that our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace be with you from God our Father, from Jesus Christ, in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As you remain standing, uh, let's sing together uh, the song, Unto God Our Saviour, Psalm 98b. be seated. This afternoon it's, uh, it's really great to be gathered in worship and also to have our sister Eleanor Hermerick with us and an opportunity again to worship. It's been quite some time since you've been able to do that with us together and it's a wonderful thing to know that we do so in the name and peace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's join in prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that we come before you with a joyful song, a song of salvation, the song of your redeeming love in Christ, the song that sings that we are yours and you are our God and that you will never leave us or forsake us, that in Christ we are indeed redeemed, alive forevermore. Praise your name. And Lord, as we come together now for this second worship service today, we pray once again for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit, both in the speaking and in our listening, that in the worship today, indeed, it may be your presence, your power, your spirit that enables us and strengthens us and challenges us and comforts us. Bless us now in the course of our worship service. For this we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, this afternoon the subject is the forgiveness of sins. And you might be interested to know that uh, the forgiveness of sins is a subject that's dealt with in Lord's Day 21 of the Heidelberg Catechism. I say interested because it's interesting that Lord's Day 21 is fundamentally the teaching of the nature of the church. You know, it began by saying, I believe one holy Catholic 
and apostolic church. And then after that, we say in the creed, and the communion of saints. And then strangely, at this point, the creed mentions the forgiveness of sins. I don't know if you've ever asked, why is that sequence there? Is there a history behind this? And I hope to perhaps just uh, explain that to you and at the same time deal with a huge topic that today, and I've noticed this again and again as a pastor, people believe in the forgiveness of sins, but to actually experience it is often another story altogether. Now what we're going to do is... uh, actually look at question and answer 56 in the Heidelberg Catechism. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the question out and I'd ask you to to answer it. Now, you don't have to look it up, it's up there for you. All right? So, uh, we'll answer it together, shall we? I'll ask the question, you'll answer it. Let's do so. What do you believe concerning the forgiveness of sins? I believe that God, because of Christ's atonement, will never hold against me any of my sins, nor my sinful nature, which I need to struggle against all my life. Rather, in His grace, God grants me the righteousness of Christ to free me forever from judgment. Amen. Thank you. Now, There are two readings. Uh, The second will be my text, or at least part of that will be my text tonight. But the first takes us to Matthew chapter uh, 18, the verses 21 to 35. Our brother Ron will lead us in reading this portion of God's Word. Matthew 18, verse 21 to the end of the chapter. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy-seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant? as I had mercy on you. And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. So far. As you hear this familiar story, Ask yourself a very serious question. How difficult is it, in fact, to forgive your brother from your heart? I know that very question humbles me. 
We're going to have our intercessory prayer now, and as a part of that also the offertory prayer. Uh, we have given our free will offerings today, both electronically and also via the box at the church, and I suspect that will stay in place until such a place a time as we are released from level two of this COVID thing, and that will probably be in place at least for another week, if not more. Let's pray. Father in heaven, again we begin by thanking you for the many blessings that we have received from you. Physical blessings. We're able to live freely here in New Zealand, COVID-19 notwithstanding. We have a health system. And Father, we have family and friends. We have a community to which we belong. We have children and grandchildren and parents who support and look after us. But above all, we have you, our God, who by grace has reached out to us and said, I will be your God and you will be my children. Thank you, Father. Thank you for what this is and means, for the way this indeed makes our life make sense. Lord, you have opened our eyes and ears by means of your Holy Spirit to see that you are God and you've drawn us to yourself in through Christ, your Son, our Saviour. Praise your holy name. And we thank you, Father, for the ability to serve you by means of our free will offerings. And we pray for your blessing upon them, both in our giving and also in those who administer these, our gifts. And we pray, Father, for the well-being of our fellowship here in Dovedale. Thank you, Lord, that we can be family. Thank you, Father, that we're able to reach out to each other and love each other in the knowledge that as we've been forgiven, we are able to forgive. As we've received grace, we are able to be gracious. As you are patient with us, we are able to be patient with one another. As you've embraced us and said, you will be my son, you will be my daughter, so we can look at each, to each other and embrace each other, saying, my brother and my sister, hallelujah. Father, will you strengthen the bond of fellowship within our fellowship here in Dovedale? Bind us together, Lord, bind us together in the glory of your love and in the power of the healing of forgiveness that we received in the blood of Christ. Enable us to love one another as you love us. Lord, we do pray for each other. We pray especially for the senior members of our congregation. We pray for those who mourn. And thinking in particular of our sister Eleanor, thank you, Father, for the grace that you've given her in the knowledge that her husband, John, is now at peace and is with you forevermore, and that he's able to sing, It is well, it is well with my soul. And Father, may we all seek that wellness and assurance, not only for ourselves, but for one another. We need it. Lord, will you be with us all in this coming week? at home, at work, at school, or wherever we study. Enable us, Father, to walk as you would have us walk, to speak as you would have us speak, and to be as you would have us be. Lord, to that end, we pray for the anointing of your Holy Spirit, that we indeed may taste and be imitators of Christ. Lord, again, we pray for those who govern and rule over us, especially as our land, our country now moves towards an election. We pray, Father, your will be done and ask that we as citizens in, in exercising our responsibility may do so also in accordance with our conscience and above all with your word. Lord, bless our free land 
and enable us also in the weeks ahead as we continue to struggle with COVID to know the best way to do the best thing for the well-being of all our citizens. And Lord, we pray for the many places in the world that do not have the same safety nets and assurances that we can have. We pray for countries like India, for many African countries where there is much poverty and as a result of poverty, very little protection from a COVID virus. And we pray, Father, please, please take this away and may there be healing found, a vaccine found, that will be available freely for all people also in treating this. Will you now be with us for the rest of this service? Hold us close to your heart and enable us to find the joy and power of your holy word. We ask you this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We're going to sing together before we go to the second reading and this time uh, from Psalm 27, Jehovah is my light and my salvation near. Beautiful song. Right, let's now go to Romans chapter 8. Up until this point, the Apostle Paul has really been describing the nature and process of salvation in Christ. And in chapter 8, he begins to speak of the consequences. Chapter 8 from verse 1, and I'm going to read the first 11 verses of this chapter. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. So those two verses will be my text. 
For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirements of the Lord, law might be, met, might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who walk according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their mind on the things of the Spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, it, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him, but Christ is in you. Although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the Spirit who dwells in you. Now, there's a lot here. I just want you to note, and we'll be looking at that in some depth in a moment, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Two thoughts, no condemnation and having been set free. Keep that in mind. Brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus, the forgiveness of sins by a just yet merciful and compassionate God is the very essence of the gospel message. Ours is the gospel, the good news from God of forgiveness. If you recall at all the introductory words in the letter to the Hebrews, the verses 1 to 3 of chapter 1, the writer summarizes in those three verses the entire ministry of the Lord Jesus. He says, Jesus is our great and eternal high priest who came for us to provide purification for sins, to provide and make possible for you and me forgiveness. He humbled himself and emptied himself and died on a cross. Why? To offer his life as a once for all perfect sacrifice, total payment for all our sins. And if you think about it, the whole subject of forgiveness comes and tumbles out of the mouth of Jesus and the rest of Scripture again and again and again. You know that Jesus taught us to pray, did he not? Forgive us our sins, or if you will, trespasses, as we also have forgiven those who trespass or sin against us. This is right there in Matthew 6. And then in the next verse, Jesus says, For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father also will also forgive you. But, and here's the warning, if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive you. It's, it's chilling words there. If you don't forgive, you're not forgiven. And then when you look at the, the teaching of the Lord Jesus, there's so many parables that, that highlight this concept of forgiveness. The, the greatest and best known, of course, is the story of the prodigal son. When his father sees this wayward son, even in the distance, he lifts up his robe and runs out towards him to embrace him. 
And the miracle of the story is the miracle of the restoration and forgiveness of that prodigal. And then the passage that Ron led us in, I don't know, I remember as a child hearing this for the first time, the forgiveness of 10,000 talents. One commentator reckoned that that's 43 wheelbarrows of, of silver coins. That's a lot of money. And this guy was forgiven that. And instead of going, wow, 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 he sees another man there who owes him a hundred denarii. That's quite a sum in those days. Uh, uh, about a half a year's work. And he takes his fellow by the neck and he says, pay what you owe me. And the servant says, is he forgiven? Doesn't show. 10,000 talents? And he can't even forget a hundred denarii? I don't know, it hits my conscience when I read this. And then there's not only the parables and the teaching of the Lord Jesus, but so often, you know, I, I just love Peter here. He's sort of, he's got the big mouth, foot in mouth man. And he walks up to Jesus and he's really worked out his theology. Well. He says, oh Jesus, <laughs> worked it out. How many times must I forgive my brother? And he comes up with the perfect number, seven. Now, we usually say three strikes and you're out. So seven's a good one. And Jesus looks at Peter and says, No, Peter, you didn't quite get that right when you read it. It says 70 times seven. And I used to think that was 490. That many times. And then the same story ends. And if somebody asks you seven times over, forgive me for I repent, do it. And brothers and sisters, is not the gospel really climaxed in the cross of Jesus? Why did Jesus go to the cross? In my place, condemned, he stood. Why? He sealed my pardon with his blood. Oh, what a saviour. Surely, the good news about Jesus is in its essence from beginning to end the gospel of forgiveness. Yet, for all that, I've been around long enough to know that most Christians, if not all Christians, really struggle with this issue of forgiveness. I am convinced that we human beings find it extremely difficult both to accept that God has truly forgiven us and as a result to be truly forgiving to others. Just examine your own conscience for a moment. I demonstrate that point, first of all, by that scripture reading from Matthew chapter 18. This guy was forgiven 10,000 talents worth. That's emperor's ransom and a little bit more. And brothers and sisters, have you been forgiven anything less than that. And we look at that fellow that couldn't forgive a measly 100 denarii. And you look at yourself and say, boy, how often am I not just like that? And this is why when that last verse that our brother Ronald read, it really got me. This is how my father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from the heart. Not simply on the surface, but from the heart. And just to show you how difficult this really is, I, I, I would also point out that Forgiveness 
is not something that flows out of us naturally, for often in the language of the New Testament in particular, forgiveness is, is stated in the form of a command. You must forgive. Not you should try to forgive. You must forgive. Listen, for example, to Paul to the Colossians. Bear with each other. Forgive each other whatever grievances you might have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. That's the language of the imperative. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Now in this context, I point to the Apostles' Creed. Some interesting information to think through. You know, the Apostles' Creed composed sometime after the time of the Apostles is in itself a testimony as to how the ancient church struggled with this question of forgiveness. As I've pointed out, it is striking that the subject of the forgiveness of sins is a part of the topic, the church. Why is this? We would have expected the subject of forgiveness in the creed to turn up after Jesus had died on the cross. That's the natural place. Why did Jesus die? For the forgiveness of sins. But the creed waits until it's describing the nature of the church. Why is that? Simply because the forgiveness of sins was something that the ancient church struggled with to such an extent that they came to believe that the, only the church itself, via its ordained priesthood, could confirm and assure a penitent sinner of forgiveness. You see, people would often come and say, am I really forgiven? And then they would go to the confessional. And there the priest, as the priest with special power, would be able to say the word, I absolve you. And it was only when, they, when the priest absolved that people found any assurance in forgiveness. They needed a special something to tell them that there was forgiveness. Now, it, it, it grew to such an extent, if any of you remember the, ancient, or the, the author Graham Greene, who wrote on this very topic in one of his great novels, where in a time of the 1920s in Mexico, there was uh, the persecution of the church, and the way the Mexican authorities destroyed the church, or thought to destroy it, was by simply destroying the priesthood. And in Graham Greene's novel, there's one priest, a sot, who is a whiskey priest, who somehow continues to sneak through. And it's because he has the power to absolve from the, for the forgiveness of sins that the church is able to survive. Without the priest... There is no forgiveness. You see, the history of the church demonstrates how much of a struggle God's people have had throughout its history with this subject of forgiveness. And think about it yourself for a moment. How often haven't you sort of for ask the Lord for forgiveness of sins, and for a while you're, whoo I'm forgiven. And then, in time, the doubts begin to come back in. And you begin to see that it's still the same old you, and you still have the same old issues, and in spite of yourself, you still have those same thoughts against that person that, that upsets you so much. And again, where is the assurance of the forgiveness of sins. So brothers and sisters, I, I, I really, I'm hoping you're thinking this through. Just see that it's easy to say, I believe in the forgiveness of sins, but it's something else, altogether different to act fact, to, 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 to find the assurance of it. 
Now, it's in this tense, sense too that I think the opening two verses of Romans 8 are memorable and extremely important. What Paul says in Romans 8 verse 1 is first of all that there is now no condemnation. What is forgiveness? It is the experience of no condemnation. There is, he says in a general way, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Condemnation. The word brings to mind a prisoner in a cell awaiting his execution. He's had his day in court, and after hearing all of the evidence, the judge has passed sentence. Guilty. And therefore, according to the law, I pronounce sentence, you will be executed, condemned. The prisoner is under condemnation. He's been tried and judged and found guilty. There is no way out. This is the final thing. But, says, P says Paul, for those who are in Christ, who find their being in him, there is no condemnation. The sentence of condemnation has been taken away. And I remember listening as a child to, 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 the, to a pastor saying that it's as though the Lord Jesus has entered into the cell of that condemned man and has said to him, I'll take upon my shoulders your sentence. I'll be condemned in your place so that from this moment you are no longer under condemnation. The picture is awesome. In Christ, in my place, he took the sentence that the judge had pronounced upon me, no condemnation. So what is forgiveness? Forgiveness is it not essentially the fact that Christ has taken my death sentence off my shoulders and put it on his own. Is that what you've experienced? Not guilty any longer because, and therefore no longer under condemnation. And then comes that, that second expression that comes out, and I'm going to develop this a little bit more. You know, it says there, and, and there is for no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, that's the good news. And then he says, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free. This takes forgiveness a step further. So far, the no condemnation is that Christ has, has entered into my cell and has taken the condemnation that I am under on his own shoulder, but then the next thing he does, he pushes me out of that cell. He sets me free. It's not so much a physical setting free, is it? It's a spiritual setting free. When I look to God, I can cry, Abba, Father, further on in chapter 8. And I can say, oh, in Christ, I have been set free. Now, I want you to notice what we've been set free from. Set free in Christ from the law of sin and death. Have you thought about that? Set free in Christ, the spirit of life in Christ 
has set me free from the law of sin and death. What's the law of sin and death? Let me give you one little illustration of it. It's not the whole picture, but it'll help anyway. Picture the following scene. A man works in a shop, as you do, and one day, in a moment of weakness, temptation overcomes him and he slips an item off the shelf and puts it in his own lunch bag. Yes, he's stolen it. And when he was about to head home with his lunch bag under his arm, his boss came over to him and tapped him on the shoulder. I think you've forgotten to pay for that item that you purchased for yourself and is in your lunch bag. Blushes, stuttered explanations and apologies follows the employee repents. Says the boss, don't worry about it, forget it, it's okay, just don't do it again. The employee has been forgiven, right? But do you think the boss will ever forget his indiscretion? Chances are that from now on, the boss will keep an extra close eye on that wayward employee. And should the man as much as put a $2 item in his purse or in his bag without paying for it, out the door. You're fired. The reason is simple. Although the boss forgave, what didn't he do? He didn't forget. He allowed what I would call the spirit or or the law of sin and death to operate. Namely, you do this and that's the consequence. That's a natural law almost. Do this and that's the consequence. Now what Paul is telling us that we who have the spirit of Christ have been set free from consequence of our sins. This is what enables Jesus to say 70 times 7. Brothers and sisters, how often does God in his mercy need to forgive you? Once a month? That's silly, isn't it? How patient does God need to be with even the most holy of us in this congregation? You see, the miracle of forgiveness, it seems to me, is that first of all we say there is no condemnation. But secondly, that in experiencing this freedom from condemnation, we're also set free from the consequences of our sin forever. You know, the book of Hebrews highlights again and again Atoning sacrifice is once for all, total, all my sins. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Forgiveness. This is what what Jeremiah says when he says, talking about the new covenant in, in, in chapter 31 there, I will forgive their iniquity, what's the next line? And I will... So next line. I will remember their sins no more. Wow. So what's the nature of forgiveness? No condemnation. What's the real nature of forgiveness? It adds, set free. And then Jesus says, as you have been forgiven, so you also must forgive one another. So brothers and sisters, in in, in one way, uh, if I ask you the question today, uh, are you forgiven? You say, yes, and you just say, God treats me now as if I'd never sinned. 
I rather like that way of looking at it. Sometimes the word justification is as if I've never sinned. Well, no, forgiveness is exactly that. As if I, a clean slate washed with the blood of Jesus. Now comes the big question. And I'm sort of coming to a conclusion here. And that's this. Can you be sure that you personally are forgiven? I mean, I can make a blanket statement, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But now comes that point. Can you personally be sure that your sins are forgiven? Well, according to the Apostle, the law of the Spirit of life, that is the basis for... Uh, 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 that is, is the basis for our assurance that God has, indeed, on the basis of Christ's atoning sacrifice, forgiven us. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But have I personally been saved? Am I personally uh, assured of that? Well, what's the... Can I use two reformed words here? What's the sign and seal, the proof of your forgiveness? Well, what did Paul say in, 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 to the Corinthians? For I determined to know nothing amongst you except what? Christ and him crucified. What's the guarantee of your forgiveness? Turn your eyes upon Jesus, right? Now, how do you know for sure that when you turn your eyes upon Jesus, God will forgive you? The sign and seal of the forgiveness that you receive in Christ is the resurrection. You see, Jesus said this, I'm going to die, and to prove who I am, on the third day, I will be raised again. I'm sort of paraphrasing here. So in a way, when we ask forgiveness in Jesus' name, yes, we, we point to the cross, but at the same time, we point to the resurrection. There is the proof from heaven that the sacrifice of Jesus was totally, 100% accepted by the Father. So, so what I often find, incidentally, is when people are seeking proof of forgiveness, they turn this way, they turn to their own feelings. But if you want the real assurance of forgiveness, don't look this way, because you'll always find a sinner that disappoints you there. When you want the real assurance of forgiveness, turn your eyes, you see, that way. Focus on the cross, but beyond the cross, focus on the fact Jesus has risen. He is Lord. He is alive forevermore. And it's the risen Jesus that has the power to say, come to me. There is forgiveness in Christ. But then I come back to that question I've, I, I, I raised a minute ago. How do you know that you personally have been forgiven? Now there are four wrong answers here before I come to a right one, or three wrong ones. You see, historically, and I've mentioned here the Apostles' Creed, particularly in the territory of Roman Catholicism. In Roman Catholicism, the proof of personal forgiveness was when you went to the priest and he pronounced absolution, the forgiveness of sins. So you could walk out of there and say, oh, I've been forgiven. Why, the priest said so, and the priest is the representative of God. Incidentally, has it ever struck you that the word priest to describe ministers is a much later invention than the scriptures themselves? But there's another way too. This whole struggle for the assurance of forgiveness, it brings me back to the Reformed churches of the 1960s. At that time, within the Reformed churches, some of you will remember your parents in this way. What hit us was a thing that we called Pentecostalism. And a lot of people from our churches walked into Pentecostal circles. Why? Because although they'd heard the preacher preach forgiveness of sins for years and years, most of them were never sure of their own forgiveness. 
And what the Pentecostal movement was, right, when you receive the Holy Spirit, when you speak in tongues, there's the proof that you've been redeemed. And so people started to seek, I'm going to speak in tongues. That will assure me that I've been personally forgiven. Historically, there's another movement known as the inner light movement. Sort of the Quaker type idea, or, or, or the, the whole concept, the pietistic idea that you'd, you'd have this overwhelming experience. My mother came from a church where when it came to Lord's Supper Sunday, nobody went. Only the elders went. And two old women, apparently, who'd had a, a special revelatory light. There was no assurance of forgiveness. And they longed. The Dutch had a saying, Macht maar is gebeuren. If only it could happen one day that I would have a, a personal inner light. And so in evangelicalism it became for a while, oh, when were you converted? And I remember one young man saying to me, well I can tell you the very stone on the, on the footpaths of Auckland where I was converted. And that stone became for him the symbol of his forgiveness. You see what's happening and, and in our own circles, you know, people say to each other, are you sure you're forgiven? And then sometimes we say in our circles, you must have faith. If you have strong faith, then you'll be sure. And brothers and sisters, I don't have strong faith. I often struggle with the weakness of my own faith. And then I take real heart in hearing the fact that Jesus say, even the grain of mustard seeds... A tiny little bit, right? So I can never convince myself by the size of my faith that I'm forgiven. How then can you receive personal assurance of forgiveness? And I'm going to be very old-fashioned now and revert back to my Reformed theology with its emphasis on sign and seal. How important... In the subject of forgiveness are the sacraments, Lord's Supper and baptism. Let me explain. My baptism, I can't remember the moment of it, but whenever I've seen another person baptise, a baby or an adult, whatever the case may be, it's been a reminder to the fact that God has placed upon me what? The sign and seal not simply of the covenant, but also the sign and seal of forgiveness. Acts 2, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, what? For the forgiveness of sins. Brothers and sisters, when in my weakness, with my mustard green seed-sized faith, I said, Lord, show me that I'm forgiven. And then the Lord will say to me, Dirk, you have received the sign and seal of forgiveness. You were baptized into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. But Lord, I only get baptized once in my life. Why don't I do it every week? Well, besides the baptism sacrament, there's the other one as well. We call it Lord's Supper. It strikes me as one of the most beautiful moments in church life that when we sit at this table and when we receive the bread and the wine in remembrance of him, we taste our forgiveness. We receive the seal of our forgiveness. Can I again use the language of scripture? It says of the bread, this Take and eat, this is my body. And of the wine, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for, there you get it again, the forgiveness of sins. So, I ask you, Are you rejoicing in the fact that you are no longer under condemnation? That you've been set free? And in your weakness when you doubt, 
that you personally have been forgiven, may I ask you to turn your eyes to the Lord Jesus, crucified and risen. Don't look this way because you'll never find assurance there. And the way we look through the crucified and risen Christ indeed is through the word, but equally through the sign and seal of both sacraments. I've been forgiven. And brothers and sisters, when you are assured of this, it becomes a million times easy, easier, 10,000 talents worth easier to forgive whatever people have done to sin against you. Forgive us our trespasses as we also have forgiven those who trespass against us. May the Lord enable us to hear and to breathe in and to live out the power of forgiveness in Christ alone. Amen. As we come to the close of the service, may I ask you to stand, and I'm going to pray and then pronounce the benediction, and after the benediction, we're going to sing of the joy of forgiveness by uh, looking at the words of that wonderful hymn, When Peace Like a River. Will you please stand? In standing, let us pray together the Lord, the prayer that the Lord himself taught us as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And let everyone say,